Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is Wired Oxac. Got another video for you guys. And before we get into it, hopefully you're all having an awesome day today and ready to learn something new here or something to refresh your memory, your brain on materials that you probably already know about. But be sure to hit that subscribe button if you're new. Hit the like button if you're enjoying the video and the information shared. Share the video, you know, all that good stuff helps out the channel. And in today's video, we're going to take a look at this common attacks room and try hack me. So let's go ahead and dive into it. Okay, common attacks with practical exercises. See how common attacks occur and improve your cyber hygiene to stay safer online. You got a few tasks that we're looking at here. You got introduction, social engineering stuff, malware, ransomware stuff, public network safety backups, conclusion. Now there is going to be a lot of reading, so I'm just going to probably skim through some of the reading, but be sure to pause the video or go to the room yourself and read the content that's displayed to you. Task number one, introduction. Our existence in a digital world makes it imperative that we understand and can protect against common attacks. This room will discuss some of the most common techniques used by attackers to target people online. It will also teach some of the best ways to prevent the success of each technique. Without further ado, let's begin. So that's great. I'm glad they're teaching us about these common attacks and then also ways to defend against these attacks so you can better protect yourself as well as the organization that you may work for. So let's get into number two here, social engineering. What is social engineering? Social engineering is the term used to describe any cyber attack where a human rather than a computer is the target. For this reason, it is sometimes referred to as people hacking. For example, if an attacker wishes to obtain a victim's password, they could attempt to guess or brute force the password they could simply ask you and that is absolutely correct. Sometimes during pen test engagements, the pen testers will pretend to be an employee or maybe a an high level executive or somebody that's you know trustworthy at the organization. And then they'll you know call the help desk and say, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so and I can't remember my password. Can you help me out? And sometimes the help desk will hand over the password or maybe they'll reset the password and give you that temporary password so you can access that account that you're targeting. Whilst the example linked above is relatively straightforward, social engineering attacks can become very complex and often result in an attack that gaining significant control over a target's life, both online and offline. Social engineering attacks are often multi-layered and escalate due to snowball effect. For example, an attack may start off by attaining a small amount of public available information, and that is OSINT, also known as open source intelligence. That's basically, you know, using Google, using other various websites out there to do your research on the target. A lot of people will have their social media rel um, relatively available to you. So you can just go to like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, and check out their social media and try to de uh, determine some information that you can use in your target attack. Yeah, social media presence, which they can use information from say your phone or broad uh, broadband provider. The information obtained from the second stage could then be used to gain more inf more useful information then escalate step by step for something like the victim's bank account best ways to understand social social engineering is to see it in action this video is from defcon 23 be sure to check this out if you haven't done so already one of the largest hack conferences in the world and cnn demonstrates some of the immense power in social engineering they're both well worth a watch you know as they say if i can you know hack your secretary then i'll need to bypass your firewalls right and it's absolutely true other forms of social engineering charismatic hackers calling your phone company and taking possession of your account is one form of social engineering however there are many types of social engineering vast topic encompassing any attack relies on tricking humans into giving act the attacker access rather than the attacker um, attacking the technology directly whilst direct interaction with targets is the most common style of social engineering USB storage devices, USB drops, malicious USB devices, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, the attacker has some kind of malicious code on this USB flash drive, and they'll get the victim to plug that into a company machine, and then the attack unfolds from there. And there, here's a case study from Stuxnet, so be sure to pause the video and read this, or just go to the room and read it yourself. And Stuxnet was very, very big. I remember hearing about this years ago when this hit the news headlines. It was crazy. So be sure to check that out if you haven't done so already. And let's continue on. In short, the limits to social engineering are at the bounds of the uh, attacker's imagination. A good social engineer can and will use a plethora of psychological tricks under any plausible context to hack their targets. Staying safe from social engineering attacks, 
In many ways, it is tricky to stay safe from social engineering as it won't always be you who the attacker's talking to, but rather someone who can give them what they need without your consent, calling your bank while pretending to be you. So as to access your bank account, that said, there are still measures you can take to protect yourself from social engineering attacks. Always be sure to set up multiple forms of authentication. For example, set difficult to guess or otherwise incorrect answers to security questions. That's absolutely correct. I remember reading a Krebs article about security questions, and I think these are a terrible form of of uh, authentication for people because a lot of times people will put real real answers to these questions here, and then well, if you're if the information is available online somewhere, well, the attacker is going to use OSINT to go out and find the information and then find the answer to those questions, right? So let's use an example here. There'll be a question about like, hey, what is your favorite animal or something? You can put it some nonsense there like water or like fire or something like that, right? That's, it'll totally throw the attacker off from that uh, security question. Never plug external media. Example would be USBs, CDs, etc., into a computer that you care about or that is connected to any devices, right? And that goes back to that USB drop as was explained before when it came to Stuxnet, somebody had a USB drive that was infected with malware, plugged it in, and all kinds of chaos unfolded. And this actually works in pen test engagements as well. Let's say you have a USB, you drop it on like a secretary's desk or some employee's desk, and you put like maybe a sticky note on there that says, um, it says like, I don't know, bonus information, or even not even a sticky note, just have it placed on somebody's desk. And then you'll have a folder or some kind of document in there that says like bonuses for 2023 or whatever. And it's like, huh, well, people are curious creatures, right? So maybe they'll go in and click that that document or Excel file, whatever, open it up. And then next thing you know, macros are launching in the background and you're compromising that victim's machine. Always insist on proof of identity when a stranger calls or messages you claiming to be work for a company whose source services you use where possible confirm with a known phone number or email address that the call or message you received was legitimate yes be sure to do that sometimes on pen penetration testing engagements they'll dress up as you know at&t or isp provider or some kind of legitimate entity you know have the shirt and everything and, so, and a lot of times people just let them through without you know, verifying with somebody from IT. It's like, hey, are you supposed to be having so-and-so here today? You know, I always follow up with that information. I actually did this before for a prior organization. When I worked there, I had created a fake um, employee ID, you know, just nothing even fancy. I just printed off a piece of paper and put it inside of a um, one of those old laminated badge things that I got from like a security conference. Put it in there, have my name on there and everything. And it was a fake name, fake, you know, everything, right? So I showed up at one of the locations and I was like, hey, you know, I'm new here. I work for the, you know, IT department. I know I want to check out one of your machines because we're seeing some suspicious activity from there. And after, you know, a brief conversation with the, with the employee, they let me in the back, got access to that machine. And then I got access to the server room. And I ended up leaving with a server in my hand, you know, it was pretty crazy. And then at another location, I did a similar thing. And this time I had access to like the vault area where they kept the servers. And then the employee even told me the key, the key code to get into the server room. It was great. It says read the task information and watch the attached videos. All right. I'm going to say you already did that. So hit that. It was the original target of Stuxnet. Target's going to be the Iran nuclear program as it has there. And this can go back to what's called rubber duckies, which are malicious USBs. Be sure to Google rubber ducky USB if you're not familiar with that. I believe Hack5 has one that you can purchase or you can find a video on YouTube or use Google to create one yourself. Task number three, social engineering phishing. Oh boy, phishing is crazy these days. Over phishing is one of the most common cyber attacks types employed by scammers and bad actors targeting individuals and businesses indiscriminately. In many cases, phishing is the initial attack factor used to gain access to a company's infrastructure before performing further attacks against the corporate network. Whilst there are many automated tools now available to help combat phishing to threats, phishing is still one of the most prolific attack vectors around. Yes, most data breaches will start from some form of phishing attack, like phishing emails will come in, you know, a, an employee may click on that link or download that malicious attachment. Next thing you know, you got a data breach on your hand or a cybersecurity incident on your hand that you need to respond to. And phishing happens on like a daily basis with organizations. What is phishing? It says phishing is a subsection of social engineering. 
whereas social engineering is a very general term used to describe any attack that takes advantage of a human rather than a computer system phishing specifically describes attacks where by a scammer or other attacker tricks a victim into opening a malicious web page by sending them a text message email or, or another form of online correspondence traditionally phishing simply referred to emails however in days of instant messaging text messages yada 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 be sure to pause the video you can read the rest here like i said i'm just going to skim through some of this um phishing in the form of text messages is known as smishing vishing is is phishing over voice chat and let's continue on phishing messages usually deploy psychological trickery which um we stated above with social engineering so it's a type of social engineering attack and nearly always involve getting a victim to click on a link to a web application owned by the attacker the victim is often asked to enter sensitive information for example login details or, or credit card information and let's go through here look at some of the attack types uh, general phishing a simple mass phishing attack which doesn't target anyone in particular although they may aim for large groups yeah you'll see a lot of these come in as you work through your organization you'll see a lot of paypal amazon microsoft tech support emails um, ups emails fedex emails and stuff and they're all phishing or oh, they all can be phishing those are popular brands that fishers will pretend to be in order to target your organization or employees Spish phishing is basically a more focused targeted phishing attack let's say they want to target a small group of employees at your organization let's target the financial employees well okay i'll pretend to be like a bank or something and i'll send them a targeted phishing email which is spear phishing welling targeting so it's even more specific than spear phishing welling targets um, high value individuals as in your c-suite executives in your company c-suite are like your cfos ceos you know cios people like that the high ranking people i call them higher ups and let's see here and it says the the messages are generally extremely well crafted and tend to be very hard to spot right as compared to general phishing which general phishing you'll see a lot of times a lot of typos etc as these get more targeted you'll see less and less of that and you'll see them more structured out and now with the things coming out these days like chat gpt you can construct a well-crafted phishing email to help you out in these um, attacks be aware that you are much more likely to encounter a general phishing attack than a spear phishing or welling attack in your day-to-day -day life. This may not be the case in your work, however, especially if you are a high-ranking member of the company, and that's absolutely true, as explained earlier. Example of a popular phishing scenario or pretext would be receiving an email purportedly from Amazon from you that your account has been used to buy a very costly item. You are then provided with a link to view your purchase history. The link looks like it goes to Amazon co.uk but actually take to attacker control web application looks like amazon login page as you enter your amazon credentials right it explains here um you get that phishing email targets the victim takes you to that that compromised website also known as the landing page and then um, as you enter in your credentials it gets captured in the back end then it gets sent off to, to an attacker right and there you go so just read through attacker sends out malicious phishing campaign Victims receive the emails, open the link, click the link, or open the email, click the link. Victims enter credentials on attacker's fake webpage. The webpage stores the credentials, sends them directly to the attacker. The attacker uses the credentials to access the site, thus taking over the victim's account. And it, let's say those happen in an Office 365 email, right? They're pretending to be for Microsoft, or they'll say like they're OneDrive tech, technical support, some, some made up stuff, right? It'll take you to that phishing site that looks like Microsoft Office 365. Um, you know login page or whatever you go and enter your credentials bam now it's sending that information back to the attacker now the attacker can use that information to log into your office 365 account or microsoft 365 account to access your information there phishing attacks work best when the malicious web page mimics an existing usually well-known web page for this reason attackers scammers will use one of the freely available tools to simply clone an existing page which can then be edited at their leisure yep they absolutely can do that and I believe you can do that with, uh, I think maybe set can do that. So look up set S E T identifying phishing attacks. Many generic attacks are relatively easy to spot. They frequently have poor grammar, as I stated earlier, and often do not address the victims by name. Instead, leaving generic, um, information, you know, like dear customer, dear user, whatever like that. That said, uh, other instances can be extremely difficult to spot with some attacks being thorough enough to fool cybersecurity professionals. And yeah, that can happen. Uh, so you got to check all your you got to check all the boxes when you are looking at these phishing attacks regardless of the attack type in many cases the pretext will be plausible for example the amazon scam listed above 
or a fake message from your bank telling you that there's been unusual activity to account, please log in to view it. This is especially true for spear phishing or rolling tax, where the pretext will be very carefully tailored to the target. Okay. And I say to this, if you get some kind of email saying your account's been compromised, be sure to manually go to that website or service, log in there yourself, and then check the activity yourself or call the financial institution from a known good phone number. All right, don't click on any of these links inside of these um, emails that say your account's been compromised. Always manually check if possible. Equally, the domain name for the Mr. Less site will use a similar but never identical um, domain name. That's true as well. See, it has an examples here, Royal Mail, and it's got a one here instead of the L, as opposed to the real website there, which is using the L instead of a one. And the same thing down here with Amazon, they have the A replaced with the four. So be sure to carefully go through these phishing emails or any emails for that matter of fact, make sure they're actually legitimate. And it's got a link down here that goes to the actual um, phishing website there as you see it's different than what it says there you can always they you can always replace a link to say whatever you want it to say you can try this for yourself click the link below right and then at the bottom it goes to a sheeps.xyz and i looked at this earlier this will redirect to a rick roll phishing or a <laughs> rick roll video on youtube in a similar vein, the from email address in the email-based phishing campaign will often be suspicious. Many generic mass phishing campaigns will simply use a Gmail address, and that's true. Not bothering to use a domain name associated with the company they are spoofing. This is a dead giveaway that the email is suspicious. The best way to identify a phishing email is to keep your eyes open and look for anything suspicious. All but the best have a mistake somewhere. In regard to the corporate or, or enterprise environment, um, be sure to have some kind of phishing email mailbox set up for users so they can report these suspicious emails too so that your team can go in and review these emails to determine if they're you know phishing spam or maybe just junk mail or legitimate emails right and this will also reinforce that security awareness in your organization like hey you know users you're, if you're getting some kind of suspicious email be sure to look for red flags in the email if you think it's suspicious be sure to send it to this email address which is monitored by the cybersecurity team and then we will let you know on our determination of the email staying safe from phishing attacks there are a variety of things that can and should do to keep yourself safe from phishing attacks delete unknown or untrusted emails while opening them if you can see anything suspicious in the email also report it as spam to your email provider or forward it to your it security department if you receive the, the email at work as i stated earlier never open attachments from untrusted emails do not click on embedded links in emails or messages always avoid or always make sure to uh, that your device has antivirus software is up to date avoid making per or making your personal information email phone number public if possible if, if you must public personal details publicly create a burner email account yep make sure to do that that's that absolutely comes in handy uh, for the occasion then destroy it as soon as it is no longer required now for me i have a like a yahoo account that's set up to sign up for various different things that i don't want to see on like my business email account or a personal email account that's geared towards a professional environment i'll have like a yahoo account set up that I can use to sign up for various different things that's for stuff i don't want to really you know get forwarded to my box my um inbox you can also check have i've been pwned to see if your email address shows up in there see if it had been involved in some kind of data breach in the past it's worth noting at this point that anyone can fall for a phishing attack, especially a complex one that has been made to look very realistic. If you accidentally fall for one, don't panic. Make sure that you change effective passwords immediately and contact IT services in the attack that happens. And I'm sure this is going to talk about multi-factor stuff, like, as you can see there down below. Answer the question below. Click the green view site if you haven't done so already. So we're going to go ahead and do that. It says the static site will display a series of emails and text messages you will be asked to identify which of these messages are genuine and which are phishing attempts once you successfully identify all the messages you'll be presented with a flag here good luck so let's go ahead and check that all right the first email we're going to take a look at here appears to be from support at google.com and I always look at the from and to information here subject a lot of times the attackers will have your email address as a blind carbon copy so you won't see it pop up under the to area there and let's go ahead and review this email. Hello, it has come to our attention that your account may have been accessed by a third party. Please log in and change your password here by clicking this link, which we're not going to do. As always, if you get an email that says you got suspicious activity on your account, be sure to manually log into your account and check there. And it says my account.googlesupport.com, and that looks kind of fishy to me. So I'm going to go ahead and click phishing email. 
Awesome. So let's go ahead and go to the next one here. Let's just take a look at this email here. So the address these emails usually come from is accounts at the banking group thm. So let's check for that from information here. Accounts at the banking group thm. So let's see here. And also hover the link here if anything looks fishy. Banking group sharedhosting.com. Hmm, sounds kind of odd. So I'm going to flag it. And let's go. So that was a phishing email. Let's continue to the next one here. Also, when you click the show issues button, it'll say, it'll show you the red flags in the email. There's a misspelling in the domain name. The sender only contains 1G instead of 2. And of course, the link domain name of the link file looks suspicious. Continuing on, go ahead and check this information out again. Hello, we haven't seen you for a while. Click here to keep hacking. Try hack me team. Tryhackme.com. All right, so I'm going to say it looks safe. Awesome. Sometimes companies have separate domain for sending emails, but the links still go back to the official website. And the last one here says accounts at acmeitsupport.thm. Private report, acmeitsupport.thm. Okay. Hello, I've attached the report you've asked for. Please don't show this to anyone. Um, okay. Sometimes there will be like links and stuff to the attachment. It'll just be like a picture of the attachment with the link under it. So I'm a, um, let's see here. I'm assuming it's going to be a phishing email because I'm not expecting uh, any reports for one. It says don't trust the PDF file attachments that aren't from trusted source or unexpected. Exactly. So let's go ahead and get that flag and put it in and then let's continue on to the next task. Continuing on to task number four, malware and ransomware. Basically, this, this portion is going to talk about what is malware. What does malware stand for? What does it do? And it's going to talk about ransomware. What's ransomware? What's it do? So we're going to skim over a lot of this and get down to the meat and potatoes. All right, malware is short for malicious software. Any software that's designed to form uh, actions on behalf of an attacker. There are many different kinds of malware. We'll be focusing on generic malware and ransomware specifically in this task. Uh, it talks about malware connecting back to the attacker-controlled server or machine, which is going to be a C2, also known as CNC, command and control. Uh, ransomware. Ransomware, pretty much everyone knows about, right? It's going to encrypt your machine or data, and it's going to ask for ransom in order to decrypt that information, that data. And a lot of times, you know, these cyber criminals may not own up to their part of the deal. They may not decrypt your information, right? Or they'll use extortion tactics. Like, hey, if you don't pay, you know, this ransom in X amount of time, then we're going to release your information that we stole on some kind of um, inform or on some kind of website on the dark web somewhere. And it goes in and talks about WannaCry ransomware. So be sure to check out WannaCry. If you're not familiar with that, you know, years ago, it was very big in the uh, cybersecurity community. It hit news headlines all over the place. It was hitting all kinds of organizations. And let's see here. Delivery methods goes in and talks about various different delivery methods. A lot of times it'll be through email and they'll have a lot of attachments like Excel files or Word documents that'll have malicious macros embedded into them so if you click that enable content button here it'll activate the, the macro in the background and do all kinds of nasty stuff on that victim machine and it says that they'll use other file types as well it talks about xe's pdfs ps1 files for power ships files bat files which are batch script files html application files hta's and javascript files now be sure to check with your security team to see if these are blocked on the email security filtering solution. You know, if you work in the cybersecurity team, uh, reach out to those email security folks. Say, hey, you know, you're blocking some of these commonly used file types. Nowadays, a lot of cyber criminals are using dot one extensions, which are OneNote files to uh, get those efficient emails through it to your environment. In short, there are many different ways and formats in which an attacker can send code to a victim. Once the code is executed, the infection begins. Alternatively, the attacker may exploit a vulnerability in a public-facing infrastructure and a corporate environment, for example, a web server, thus giving themselves an opening into the internal network and allowing them to start a large attack facilitated by malware. It happens quite a bit. You'll see a compromise like S2 buckets or something in the cloud that's not secured properly, and the attackers will find that vulnerability, exploit it, and then take control of your systems that way.
Staying safe, staying safe from malware, the ransomware in particular, is best done with a combination of awareness and keeping things up to date. Always accept updates and patches when offered, especially in important software like operating systems. Updates often contain fixes to security flaws, etc., etc. Never click on suspicious links, especially in emails. Try not to open file attachments if possible. If it looks suspicious, delete it or you know send it to the appropriate cybersecurity team to review. Right. Always be on the lookout for people trying to get in. Get you to download or run files. They'll happen a lot in these tech support scams. Um, they'll maybe send you a phishing email with the number to call. You call that number, and it's the actual scammer on the other end. They'll say, "Hey, you know, I'm going to send you this link through a chat or through maybe a follow-up email. Click this link, and they'll download some kind of you know software. And next thing you know, they they have taken control of your, your machine. Never plug unknown media devices, USB uh, devices." Like I talked about earlier, those rubber ducky devices or just any suspicious um, USB drive that you're not, you don't recognize. All right, send that to the security team for review. Never plug or uh, already talked about that. Always back up important data. It's very, very important. A lot of people, a lot of organizations do not properly back up their data. So when they get punched in the mouth by ransomware, they're going to be in some hot water because um, they don't have the means to recover that information um, appropriately. Make sure that your antivirus software is always up to date and activated, and that's very important as well. Make sure um, your security tools in general are up to date, because if they're not, they could be missing some important information that can say, hey, you know, we discovered this new fancy ransomware strain or malware strain, and, and we need you to update your antivirus solution. Well, if it's not updated, how is it going to detect that? If it's going to be using, you know, signature-based detections, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you or your business get infected with ransomware, do not pay the ransom itself. Right? Instead, contact your uh, local authorities immediately. Be sure to follow your standard operating procedures in your um, environment. Right? Usually, the cybersecurity team will take care of this or deal with the situation. Um, hopefully, you have backups, offsite backups, if possible. Otherwise, you may end up paying the ransom. A lot of companies will pay these ransoms, and that will support the ransom operators continue attacking people. What currency did the WannaCry attackers request payment in? I'm going to go ahead and say uh, Bitcoin. So let's type that in, Bitcoin. Awesome. So let's continue on to task number five. And scroll back up here. Fortunately, I have not been involved in a ransomware attack in my workplace. Uh, passwords and authentication overview. For better or worse, passwords are an integral part of most authentication systems we use passwords to protect everything from our social media accounts to our banking applications. Unfortunately, despite their significant importance, it is still all too easy to create and use an insecure password and even easier to take other actions that lower the overall security of the system, yada, yada, yada. Um, be sure to pause the video and review all of this. Like I said, I'm going to skim through because this is a lot of reading. And for the sake of the video, we're going to skim through some of it. What makes a strong password device on what constitutes a... Um, strong password has changed over time and past. People were advised to choose compact passwords that were easy to remember, for example, and you can see it there. Um, the passwords above is, is collected of lowercase, uppercase letters, symbols, numeric digits, yada, yada, yada. Um, I would say that now it doesn't need to probably be this complex. I would make your password long as long as you can. Uh, I recommend 16 characters minimum, right? And maybe throw in a you know, a couple numbers or a, a symbol, right? You don't need something that's going to be re really crazy. Better yet, use a password manager that will store your passwords inside of that software tool. And you can have passwords to various different things like your bank account, password, um, to log to your email, et cetera, et cetera. And many times these password managers will generate these passwords for you. So you don't have to remember it. All you have to do is remember the master password to log into that password manager and it'll have your passwords there. So it's, uh, current best practices lean more towards yeah length than complexity, as I said it before, right? This is a lot easier to remember than something like this, right? Or something like this. It's crazy. Um, password managers will generate some stuff like this. So if you're using a password manager, just generate a random password and then just save it inside of there. And you can just easily copy and paste it into whatever you need to. Uh, it says drawback is usability. However, this is largely mitigated by using a password manager, right? Which will be discussed in the next task. Uh, pretty much already explained it, but let's continue. Uh, what makes a weak password 
people often go to for simple passwords that mean something to them often one of the simple patterns for example a commonly used pattern is a name location followed by a year followed by exclamation mark for example gareth 2010 or you'll see spring uh, 2023 fall 2023 you know yada 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 easy to guess right these attackers know that and they're going to use that in, the, in their automated password attack tools to brute force your password or they'll use it in like credential stuffing attacks or something like that password sparing attacks etc cetera, etc cetera. and it goes on and explains weak password stuff here so be sure to review that um, exposed passwords unfortunately not every service stores passwords securely making it uh, doubly important that you don't reuse passwords and uh, go ahead and click this down arrow and read through here this information there it tells you about that and also to point out again um, sites like have a been pwned will sometimes have that information in there so you can go and plug in your email account and see if it's been compromised in one of these big data breaches out there so what happens if a service gets hacked and their database containing user confirmation gets leaked a base case scenario the service has used a secure hashing algorithm it may have a strong and you may have a strong you know, password in this case, your password is safe, but your email address or username may still be leaked publicly. And that's absolutely true. Worst case scenario, your plain text password is either immediately available or is easy for an attacker to find. If this happens, then both the username and password are known to the attacker, allowing them to take over your account or perform credential stuffing attacks using your stolen username and password pair against other services to see if you reuse them elsewhere yada 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 and as i already said have i been pwned so be sure to check out that website uh, password attacks an attacker has a few options when it comes to attacking passwords and authentication systems some attacks are entirely local working entirely on a device owned by attacker without interacting with target services at all other attacks are remote involved in the original server local attacks require stolen copy of credentials and question a file full of stolen usernames and uh, emails and hashed passwords and they use software like Hashcat or you know, John Ripper or something to brute force those password hashes and stuff and find the um, actual password itself. And as I said before, authentication type attacks, you know, maybe they'll use Hydra or some kind of other software that will automate that process for password spraying or credential stuffing attacks. Um, okay, let's go back here. Put yourself in the shoes of a malicious a hacker. You have managed to dump the password database for an online service. But you still have to crack those hashes click the green button start the task above so we'll do that as soon as we do this here based on the content of the website you have uh, generated a password list as follows so uh, let's go back up real quick and do that view site here and let's go back here passwords okay copy list the password in the password list so let's go ahead and do that go control c and then uh, control v awesome so let's go ahead and click go so let's do that password found try hack me one two three found awesome uh look at the current word hash section of the hash cracker notice that for each word you enter md5 hash so let's go ahead and click ok here and it's target hash right there current hash or word hash and it's got it there so it, it basically um had this known hash here and then discovered the actual password from that hash. Yep, if I have hash, the two hashes match the password that's been found. The hash cracker should find the password that matches target hash very quickly. What is the password? I already have it here, so I'm going to copy and paste it into there to answer this question below. Hit submit. This is a very simple browser based example. However, in reality, local hash cracking with the word list isn't any more complex from a high level perspective. It's the same technique but with a lot more potential passwords and that's absolutely correct as i said before you can use hashcat or like you know john ripper or something to do this stuff and there's also online hash or hash or password hash cracking tools available next task we'll focus we'll look at some of the common account protection measures as well as um, how to generate secure passwords so let's go ahead and continue on to task number six Okay, so task number six, multi-factor authentication and password managers. Now, this is pre a pretty lengthy uh, read-through section here, so I'm going to skim through some of the material, and be sure to pause the video and review the information yourself, or go to the room and check out the information yourself. All right, basically, this is an overview. Of previous tasks, we talked about common attacks, and now we're going to talk about how to think defend against those common attacks against passwords and authentication systems. All right, multi-factor authentication. Now, what is that? Uh, multi-factor authentication, a.k.a. 
MFA is a term used to describe any authentication process where you need more than one thing to log into. Most common example of this is when you enter your password in an account, it asks for your six digit code, sent to your phone, and expires after X amount of account time. And this particular one is called time based one time password or TOTP. That's a mouthful. And one of the most um, second factors currently in use, or most common second factor in use, uh, multi factor sometimes referred to as 2FA, two-factor authentication, which is a form of multi-factor, right? Um, usually it's something something you know, which would be like a password, yada, yada, yada. Um, something you have, which would be like a hardware or FIDO key, like a YubiKey key or something, hardware token. Um, something you are, which would be biometrics, like an iris or retina scan, right? So you're gonna use like a password. Okay, I have my password, right? Authenticate it through that first mechanism. The second mechanism, let's say it's gonna be a thumbprint biometric thing. So I'm gonna use my thumbprint for the second factor to log into that. And let's continue on. It talks about SMS messages, uh, also known as text messages, which is crap. Please do not use SMS-based uh, multi-factor authentication if possible, All right? Just various weaknesses when it comes to that. Be sure to do some Googling on those weaknesses to find out more information about that. Um, Let's see here. Um, email is another one that's I do not recommend using. Avoid using email as a second form of um, authentication. Security-based questions are also terrible because people put in real information there. If you do use security questions, also known as knowledge-based questions, be sure to put in fake information for the answers. Uh, let's see. Most services will provide you with an option to use an authentication app or authenticator app. Google Authenticator is a well-known one. Microsoft has one. Um, Duo has one called Duo. Um, I've used quite a few. They work great. And it talks about using Authy. It's available for Android, iOS. Let's see here. Password managers, we already discussed before, generating strong passwords, password managers can do that for you. And it talks about commonly used password managers here. One pass, last pass, key pass, bit ordering. I use, I use key pass, it works great. Uh, bit ordering I heard is good as well, so be sure to check that out as well. And then it's got this Krebs on security article about SMS dangers, so be sure to check that out if you're unfamiliar with that. Where you have the option, which um, you should use a second authentication factor between SMS-based TOTP or authenticator app, what should you use? I'm going to say app because the um, SMS one is crap. There's a lot of security holes in that, and authenticator apps or better. Uh, another thing to note here, if you're going to use an authenticator app, sometimes they'll have the the push notifications, whereas you say you log in with your password and then it's a second factor is going to send you a push notification to your mobile device, right? It's going to say um, accept or deny that request. Well, um, last year there was a big thing when it came to what's called um, MFA fatigue, right? Attackers were logging in with people's passwords, using as passwords, right? Well, they had push notifications set up and they would send those notifications constantly to that victim, right? And a lot of times the victim, instead of reporting the issue to like the security team, you know, they'll get tired of it. Or well, you get annoyed when you see a bunch of notifications on your phone, right? So what are you gonna do? You're gonna click okay, right? So you can make the notifications go away. So be aware of that. It's called MFA fatigue attacks. So Google that if you're not familiar with that attack vector. Um, task number seven, public network safety. Uh, this is going to talk about, um, looks like VPNs and stuff like that, website stuff. The internet plays a gargantuan role in modern life with most people being connected in some way, virtually, constantly. As such, pu most public spaces, cafes, restaurants, public transport, fully equipped Wi-Fi to let people catch up on email, et cetera, et cetera, public Wi-Fi, while it's incredibly handy, gives and attack or ideal attorneys to attack other users devices or simply intercept and record traffic to steal assistant information now when i say a public wi-fi and stuff like that anything public you know i try to treat it as like a public restroom you don't know what you're going to find when you go to the public restroom right it could be clean it could be dirty what have you same thing when it comes to public wi-fi you know it could be good or it could be bad where it comes to an attacker is doing some kind of um exploit on that Wi-Fi and now they're capturing your information that goes through this. So what you want to do is um, make sure the website you're connected to is of course HTTPS, which is the secure version of HTTP, which means um, the information is encrypted. So it'll help defend against like man in the middle attacks where you have the attacker sitting in the middle of that transmission or that tra that data transfer 
and if it's using HTTPS, well, the, the data is encrypted, so the attacker won't be able to see that traffic going through. Whereas if it's an HTTP un an encrypted connection, the attacker can, can see everything going through um, that connection. Also use a VPN, which explains down here below, a VPN, a virtual private network, basically an encrypted tunnel going from your device to that particular um, server on the other end so that the attacker, if they're doing some kind of man in the middle attack, they won't be able to see that information because it's encrypted. And it's got a couple of them listed out here, Proton VPN and uh, Molbat VPN, which I've never heard of before. Uh, let's see, website connectivity or connection security talks about HTTPS, TLS, um, it's encrypted. In most browsers represents a padlock left at the search bar, which means it's encrypted, right? It means that the website is encrypted. It doesn't mean that the website is, is secure, as in, let's say, um, it could be like a phishing landing page, right? A lot of times attackers will use HTTPS websites. And if you're just going off this lock alone, then you could be in some uh, hot water. So be sure to uh, be, be cautious of what you're connecting to if you're going to be using public Wi-Fi and stuff like that. Um, let's see here. Talks about TLS certificate issues. Um, it says full page errors related to certificate security when trying to access a web page that can look something like that. And I'm sure you guys have seen something similar uh, when it comes to certificate errors. As a general rule, if you see an error like this, you should click the go back button or an equivalent in other web browsers, it usually means that there's something wrong with the encrypted connection, potentially leaving your traffic open to being stolen, okay? Deploy the interactive content by clicking the green button. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and do that. And let's see, interactive content for this task demonstrates what can happen if information is sent over a potentially unsafe network. With various types of encryption or lack thereof, there's no flag for this task, but you're encouraged to try each of the different scenarios, mixing and matching options in the control box. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. Uh, we're going to click view site here and see what it loads up. Uh, welcome to the traffic interception content. This page allows you to see how VPNs and HTTPS can be used to prevent an attacker. The ability to intercept your traffic, yada, yada, yada. All right, you're going to use send uh, request button to simulate the um, exercise here. So let's go ahead and start. And let's see here, controls, right? So we're going to do it by itself with nothing on. See, it goes through the gateway, which is the router. Attacker has got all your information, right? You can see everything going through here, going back and forth. Now, we're going to try it again with um, a VPN. And it gives you the explanation here. So let's go ahead and fire this on VPN. Send it again. Gateway. Attacker can't see it because it's an encrypted uh, tunnel. Send it back. All right, your VPN. Encrypt all the traffic, entering, leaving the computer, stop intact. However, the web request you sent was still unencrypted, meaning that the VPN server could read, modify, or lock any sensitive data being transmitted. Okay, now let's try it with just HTTPS. It's going through, now let's see their explanation here. So you have the web request encrypted HTTPS, prompting the server to respond the same way. This prevents the attacker from being able to read the captured traffic. However, the tra any traffic that is not web-based may not be encrypted and can be read and modified by the attacker. Absolutely correct. Now let's do it with both of these on here. All right. Now it should everything should be secured. You got using the VPN and your, the website is using HTTPS. And there you go. You sent a web request, HTTPS, wrapped inside, encrypted VPN tunnel. Attacker was not able to read any traffic. And even after the VPN encryption was removed, the request made to the destination server was still encrypted, preventing anyone other than you and the server from seeing either the request or response. Well done. All right? The gist of it, make sure it's using HTTPS and make sure you're also using the VPN. Okay? If you're going to be using um, public Wi-Fi, and then, of course, make sure the website's actually secured which HTTPS so let's get out of this and continue on to task number eight all right we're gonna skim through these last few sections here all right we're gonna talk about backups in task number eight backups are arguably the single most important defensive measure you can take to protect your data no matter what happens if you have appropriate backups in place then you can recover from the damage all right and it goes in and talks about the golden rule three two one um three would be 
three up-to-date backup or copies of your backups include the original copy but all copies must be maintained and then two different storage mediums for example you can use cloud backup and a usb storage device this can also include a hard drive on your computer uh, one would be an off-site backup which could be you know cloud services or some off-site data center somewhere if you're in a corporate environment and also in regard to a corporate environment be sure to have offline backups that way if you do get hit with ransomware the attackers won't have access to those offline backups because they're offline right and you can recover accordingly a lot of times companies aren't doing this they're not having appropriate backups so when they do get punched in the mouth by ransomware they're in a heap of trouble when they try to recover from systems it says what is the minimum number of the big backups and it says up here it was three of how many at a minimum should be stored in another location that was one for these off-site backups here and it talks about uh, fr how frequently depends on the sensitivity of the data and let's go ahead and talk about number uh, task number six here updates and patches uh, it talks about the eternal blue exploit that was um, used years ago back in 2017 m17-010 so if you're unfamiliar with that be sure to check out the blue room so you can get some hands-on keyboard experience with that i also have a video of that i'll have the link in the description box and then it talks about the um the link to the actual m17-010 to the vulnerability details right basically software updates keep your software up to date right the latest security patches etc etc so that um it'll be less likely to be exploited by attackers, right? If the, if the vulnerability is known, a lot of times it'll be posted in the public. Okay, this is a known vulnerability. So attackers will immediately start reviewing that information and then come up with some kind of exploits. Sometimes the exploits will be released to the public on um, like Twitter or something like that. Uh, antivirus updates, same thing goes here. Oh, uh, let's go back a little bit. It talks about end of life stuff here. Like Windows 7, for example, and XP is another one. You should always replace end of life systems as soon as possible but a lot of times organizations can't do that because of costs or or that um they'll have some kind of very important system that's only supported on some kind of old operating system so they can't move off right away well you can put compensating controls in place let's say that you have a system like that well what you want to do is something like you'll put it off in its own little uh, dmz or like quarantine zone where that it can only run you know this software or it can only run on these ports it can only run these protocols, et cetera, et cetera. So you have that system locked down as much as possible so it can be um, less likely to be exploited in an attack. Uh, antivirus updates it goes back to software, antivirus is software, right? So you want to keep up to date, keep the databases up to date. If it's using signature based detections, make sure it has the latest signatures on there so it can detect the, the newest and greatest, you know, malware, stuff like that. Sometimes antivirus solutions will have um, heuristics or behavior based um, capabilities, whereas if it detects some kind of weird suspicious behavior in your system it'll flag that particular service or um, task that's running in the background or whatever and it'll tell you like hey this is suspicious maybe malware or something like that so make sure your antivirus up to date so it can have the latest capabilities and signatures and let's close out here with task number 10 conclusion I mean, we talked about various different types of attacks that are used by uh, malicious attackers and remediations to defend against these attacks um, be sure to go back to this room and read and understand the information that was discussed. Watch the video again if you want to. And always um, be sure to learn and understand the content discussed in the video and the room itself. As always, guys, thank you for watching. And be sure to hit that subscribe button. If you're not subscribed, hit the like button and comment below your thoughts and opinions. Thank you for watching. Have a nice day.